Hello and welcome. Tonight we're looking at ScreenFlow 7. It is a first look. Uh, it's very, very new. But before that, who am I? Uh, if you don't know, I'm Elaine Giles, longtime trainer, podcast host, inveterate geek and long, long, long time ScreenFlow user. I go all the way back to version one in 2008. But tonight we're taking a quick look, a first look at it. If you are with us live, it was released today. If you are watching this later, it was released on the 1st of August. What I intend to do is show almost all of the new features, which is going to be going at some, otherwise we'll be here all night. But um, I will at least talk about all of the major new features. I will demonstrate most of them. So um, it will be very demo heavy. Feel free to ask questions as you go. I have one half of an eye on the chat. I also have an assistant who will be taking any questions that you've got and putting them into a notebook for me to answer either as we go through it or at the end. So feel free to ask any questions you like. Um, one more thing just before we start, I'll be talking about the upgrade system and the pricing, etc. at the end, because let's be honest, you're all interested in the features. We'll worry about the price later. OK, so. I've got a few demo files, not too many. Most of this will be working as we go, but uh, let's have a look at ScreenFlow. First thing to think about, uh, you can see that I've actually got ScreenFlow 6 installed as well. How I did that was rename ScreenFlow 6 and then put 7 on as well. So if you wanted to do that, you could do that. The only thing is you can't run them both at the same time. So I'll be using 7 tonight, obviously. Oh, and this time it's opened on the right screen all day. It's been opening on the wrong screen. Right, there we go. So the first thing you will see is the welcome screen. As I've been working with this, um, it's been linking to the tutorials for the old version, version six. Let's have a look where it's linking to now. It's opening, opening up Chrome on my other screen. And with a bit of luck, they will have put on some uh, new videos. It's thinking about it slowly. Oh, now come on, Chrome, don't let me down. Uh, there we go. It is the tutorial page on um, screen telestream.net. It looks very, very busy at the moment, doesn't it? What I'll do is I'll leave that on the side and we'll go back and see uh, what they've managed to get up there because they literally have only just released this about 90 minutes ago. Right, so, oh, something's crashed in Chrome. That's a good start. Let's lose that. And uh, ah, here we go. Here's the tutorials. So yes, the tutorials up there. There is a few of them for ScreenFlow 7. So uh, if you want more tutorials, you can always go up there and you can get to that page. Don't have to remember the URL. You can get to it directly from the welcome screen here. Then within the welcome dialogue, you have, if you've used other versions, it'll look very familiar straight away. You can have a new recording. You can set up everything that you record from in there. So your desktop, whether you record an iOS device, you can choose where you record your video from, your audio, and whether you record the computer audio as well. You can also create a new document, a completely new document. That works best when you are assembling video from other sources, etc. And you've got recent documents. So there's a, a cat video. You can't do a demo of a video app without a cat. And I've got a cat. So hopefully we'll have time to look at the cat. So um, that's what you've got in there. I'm not going to start with a new recording because it would cause complete havoc with everything else that I have got running at the moment. But I have made some recordings that we can edit and I will create new files that we can edit as well. So first thing to notice, this should be looking slightly different already. It has a new darker interface. So I'm going to make a new file so you can see the new darker interface. The dark interface is now the default. I I must admit, I quite like it. The only bit that's throwing me a little bit is when I go into the annotations and, and it, the default color is blue and it, the blue and the dark is a little bit too dark for me. But it, that's the new look of it. Um, by default, you will have these. Uh, your tracks will be a little bit bigger than mine. I have mine very small by default. If you're thinking you're not seeing too much of the interface right now, that's because I'm broadcasting this at 1600 by 900. Usually on my 27 inch iMac, it's full screen retina, it looks fantastic. It only looks a little bit small so I can broadcast it to you guys. Now, if you don't like that and you're already thinking, oh no, don't want that, you can go into your preferences and in your preferences, the very first preference in general is the interface and you can turn it back to light and it takes it straight back to the older versions of uh, ScreenFlow. So if you do want to go back, you can. 
Seeing as though most people don't venture into the properties and the, the preferences until they've got a problem, I'm going to leave it set to dark at the moment. Uh, everything that's in here is fairly similar to previous versions. So I have my countdown set to three. I have got it to send the diagnostic information. Um, for reference, this is the last beta version I'm using. I've actually just, just done a check and there is an update, but I wasn't risking it with 30 seconds to go. That would have been insane. I'll do it as soon as I've finished. Um, I have actually edited video with this in the last four days that is now available for sale at places. So I have had no problems at all uh, editing real life situations with it whatsoever. I have come across a couple of foibles uh, which may be fixed in that new version though. So the other options that you've got in here are timeline which will be very similar. I'm going to come back to shortcuts and you've got advanced as well which again is identical to the previous versions. Uh, there is a license option. It has got my license emblazoned across it so I'll leave it untouched. This version is the direct from uh, Telestream version but it is also available in the App Store or it should be but right at this second I'll do a, another quick refresh on my other screen. Oh it's now available. Uh, literally, I've been refreshing, 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 and um, it's not been available. It is now available. So you can actually buy this. Now, why I'm mentioning that at this point, although I will talk more about prices later, is it's on special, special offer. It will not be this price for long. The last I heard, it was going to be a one day sale. So at the end of this, if you've decided that you're going to do it, don't wait because the price will increase if you're getting it from the Mac App Store. So it is available right now. Right, so back to what I've actually got in here then. So we've looked at the interface. Another thing to notice about the interface is something that has gone away, but it's gone away for a reason. You used to be able to go to view and go to preview. And when you went to preview, it took your video virtually full screen without entering Mac full screen. That option has disappeared, but it has gone for a good reason. It's gone because they've added some extra options, which are the three options that you can see here. And these three options are hide the inspector, hide the timeline and show the quick media library, all of which will make more sense when we've had a look at them. So hiding the inspector hides the inspector on the right hand side. Then go back to view and choose hide the timeline and that hides the timeline. From there, you can zoom in to that and watch it virtually full screen with the transport controls at the bottom. So that is a feature that they've actually added. Now, obviously, that's two things you have to do instead of one. There are ways that you can work around things like that. So I'll talk about that at the end. But you do have that option and that option is there instead of preview. So if you're looking for preview, you won't find it. So I'm going to turn the inspector back on and turn the timeline back on. Won't make much sense if I don't. And I'm going to zoom back out to the full canvas. If you're wondering how I'm doing that quickly, it is command, control and zero. Um, and I can move into the canvas with um, command plus command equals depending on how you look at it and uh, move out again with command minus on the top so it's the two is the two keys next to the zero on the top hold the command key down and move in and out with those once you are zoomed in or out you want to go back to full screen it is command control and zero so you, i'll be doing that a lot because as i said i've made my screen smaller okay so we've looked at that now there is one other feature that uh, if you've got a macbook pro 2016 with a touch bar you're going to like and that is it now supports the touch bar. Now, obviously, I'm demonstrating this on an iMac, so that's not going to work too well. Or is it? Because what I do have is this at the bottom of the screen, which is uh, called Touche, and it is going to let me demonstrate to you what this would look like on a MacBook Pro. And there it is at the bottom of the screen. It will make much more sense if I actually close this one. Don't need to save that. And I go back to my data and I open up a file that's got some data in it. So I do have, I've got a file here, so let's open that. And I need to go back to full screen again, don't I? There we go, so I've got a video. Now you can see that at the bottom, where I'm looking at um, Touche, where's my mouse pointer gone, there it is. Right, I can actually interact with this. So it isn't just a picture showing me what it would look like on a MacBook Pro with a touch bar, it's actually letting me interact with it. As I was working through the release notes for this last night, I was using an app called PDF Expert and I was saying, OK, so how do I get this Touche working properly? And I ended up actually using Touche to actually access features within PDF Expert. So as I've been using this and 
thinking, OK, how will it demonstrate that? Will it show that? I've actually been using it. So Touche is free. I'll give you more information at the end. And if you do want that extra little bit of interface to interact with it, and you don't have a MacBook Pro with a touch bar, you can actually use this. So uh, I could turn the sound on and off. You can see it's actually interacting with my Mac. Uh, I can change the volume which we don't want to do or I'll hear myself and that's never good, is it? So you've got all of these things that you can actually do in there and I can bring up extra options as well. So if I can't remember things, how to do them, I can do that. So that is what I mean by, and hang on, it's turned the audio back on again, go away. Um, that's what I mean when I say it's got touch bar support. So um, if I go back to ScreenFlow, make that active, and I start zooming in and out of the timeline, you can see what happens at the bottom. So as I zoom into it, you can see how far I'm zoomed in, replicated, how it would be on the touch bar on your MacBook Pro. OK, I'll turn that off so it's not distracting. But if anybody's got any questions about it, I can quickly toggle it back on later and we can have another look at it. OK, now, one of the things that uh, I swiftly went over in the preferences was one of the great new features is that you can define user defined shortcut keys. So if we go back and look at this extra option, which is shortcut keys, you can now define keys in here and they are all grouped by um, section. So file menu, edit menu, mark menu, everything that you need is in there. And if you use something and there isn't a shortcut key for it. So let's have a look down here. Let's say that you publish to YouTube a lot and you would like to specify shortcut key for that. You can do that in here. Thing to remember, so I'm going to open these up again, right? It's just a few little options before we do that. So the first thing you can do is yeah, you can search for it. So if I'm looking for YouTube, I can put a search term in there and it will filter out the menu. So I don't have to know where the command is. I can just search for it there. Once I've got it, I can then customize it. Now, it doesn't like it if you want to customize the defaults because you need to go back to the defaults, obviously. So what I've done is I've created a default set for me. So this is my default set. So I would want to edit that YouTube one. Let's have a look at that. So I want to publish to YouTube and now it lets me put a shortcut key in for that. So I'm going to go for hopefully something that's not already allocated, which is command option control and Y. Yes, it seems to like that. All right. And it's as simple as that to do it. Just click in the box, press the key and that's it. You're done. It now, if I take the filter away, I can see all of them, but what have I actually changed? And I'd have to go through and see what I'd changed. And so as I'm going through, does it show me what I've changed? It does. The YouTube one, so let's just make sure you can see that. The YouTube one's in bold, which is indicating to me that I have edited that. But there's an easier way, which is to go up to the customized option, and that will show you just the keys that you have edited, the ones that you have changed. So just the customized one, if you wanted to change it back to something else or take that customization away, you could do that. That would be the fastest way to do it. So be aware that you have the option to do this with those keyboard shortcuts. But even better than that, because you may work on multiple machines. Now, let's not get involved in the licensing. It is activated if you bought it direct from Telestream, but you can deactivate a license, go to another machine and then reactivate it. Um, it's also a good idea just to back this up if you only do have a single Mac. For instance, about six, eight weeks ago, my iMac died, gave me absolutely no indication it was going to die. It just died. And it, there was no coming back. It was the hard drive that had gone. So if I'd only had that Mac and I only had this installed on one machine and I hadn't exported these settings, I'd be pretty upset. So let's see how you can actually work with these and make a backup for yourself. You can choose to export your shortcuts. So the default set of shortcuts that you have created. So I'm going to go into my data folder, which is on my desktop, and I'm going to give this a name, which is Elaine's default shortcuts. There we go. And just save it. And that's it. That's all there is to it. There is really no excuse not to do that. Um, I'm noticing that somebody's put in the chat here that the one with the shortcuts is well solved it in connection with Keyboard Maestro and other Better Touch tool. I use both of those and that's exactly how I do it. Um, Keyboard Maestro would give you the option not only to map a shortcut to one 
command within ScreenFlow. It would allow you to map one keyboard shortcut to two commands. So as I briefly talked about with the preview option that's now missing, if you consider that the preview option has been re replaced with the hide the timeline and hide the inspector, what Keyboard Maestro would let you do is make one shortcut key that activated both of those options and toggled them on and off. Haven't really got time to create that and show you that tonight, but I can certainly do another video and show you exactly how to do that. And that's what I do. What another benefit of using an external thing up to now has been that Keyboard Maestro uses Dropbox to synchronize its settings, which means that you automatically have a backup of the settings you've configured. So it certainly has benefits. One of the disadvantages with it is you don't get to see your shortcuts in the menu. So if we come out of the shortcuts option and we go up to file and publish, we should now see, let's have a look at it, that the keyboard shortcut that I allocated to publish to YouTube is actually showing in the interface. And that's the one thing Keyboard Maestro can't do. So now you can actually back these settings up. It might be a good idea to do it in here. It really depends on your precise circumstances as to which way would be best there. But that is a little bit beyond screen flow. So let's actually get back and actually have a look at screen flow. OK, so we've saved a keyboard, um, a set, a default set. What we can then do if we go back in to our preferences and back into here, you can also choose to import them. So it will just allow you to look at the files as long as you've named them properly. And what I tend to do is add a date to the end as well, if need be. Or if it's a customized set when you're doing a specific job and you would like a different set of sort of shortcut keys, you can do that. And it's a simple matter of just selecting it and clicking open. Couldn't be easier than that. OK, so we've looked at that now. The biggest feature that they have added as far as I'm concerned, only because I've been going on about it since ooh, version one, is the global library. Now, what a global library meant to me was if we look at this video that I've got here and I'll take it back and just show you, there's just one element in it. This is the library, the document library, and there's one file in it, which is an iStock video of 11 and a half seconds. And it's already on the timeline. But I might want to add extra elements to that. And I certainly do when I'm making my videos for YouTube. And what I wanted was one single place to go to to get those assets. So this is your document library and what they've actually added. We've got in here um, the main library so you can get to your photo booth photos and your iTunes. I haven't actually had chance to check if it links in with photos because I've never run photos. I know there's an alarming confession, isn't it? But I've never run the photos up. Maybe if I had, it would appear in there. I don't know. If you're watching and you use it, let me know in the chat. Does it appear or not? But uh, you have access to assets that are in photo booth or in iTunes. But the big thing is this third option, which is your global library. So as I've said what it is, it's the one place in ScreenFlow across all your documents that contains elements that you reuse. So the standard example would be watermarks. It would be titles, credits, bumpers, anything like that that you use in multiple places. Now, it's really a I wouldn't be doing it with this video, but you know what? It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter just to show you. So what I'm going to do is open up an app where all I have um, again, I don't want to go into too many different apps, but if you're interested, let me know and I can talk you through it. Um, what I've got, I have all my assets at the moment in an app called PicSave. And it's a little bit like Lightroom or Photos is for your photos, only for me, it's for assets. So what I'm going to do is show you that. There it is there. There's the icons that I've been using when I've been building up my presentation for this. And I've got lots of other things in here. I have sidebars with my name on. I have watermarks in all the colours, in all the sizes. I have posters that I use. So all of my stuff's in here. But wouldn't it be great if the stuff that I use in my video was actually in ScreenFlow? So that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to go and find my watermarks. And I want my uh, let's use these lower quality ones because they're the right size, which is I've got four watermarks in here that are all 1280 by 720. Um, I'll add them and then add them to the, not just to the library, but to the canvas. And then you'll actually see what they are. But to add them to the library is as simple as dragging and dropping. It's exactly the way that you would add it to the document library. But this time you're adding it globally onto ScreenFlow. So I'll add a couple of other elements as well. I've got some uh, idents that I use in my YouTube videos. So I've got, uh, in fact, let's take them all in. 
let's take them all in there's just five there uh, they're very very big for our quality purposes but it's that simple now i have them in there that's it i'm done so if i make a new file don't prove me out to be a liar here please right as i go into there and i go into my global library there are the items that i have actually added and to get them onto my canvas simple matter of dragging and dropping as i said these assets are very big but if i go in and make them oh is it 25 percent? no it was 40 percent, wasn't it uh, maybe not was it 30 percent? Let's, let's randomly choose uh not not even quite there we go they're the, they're the right ratio there you go so it's the right size if I go back now and I choose my lower right, uh, no, left, lower left watermark, drag and drop that on. Where have you stuck yourself? Uh, come on, let's put you in there. There it is. It appears down the bottom there. So if I zoom in there, go across to it, you can see my watermark. There it is. So they are now available from the global library. I will never have to add them again. You can manipulate them in exactly the same way as you can any other assets, but you don't actually have to go in and go and find them. There's the first instance I put on right in the middle of the screen. I have no idea how that happened. There we go. So I'll uh, close that one down. Don't need that. Just showing you that they were global, that I'd added them in one file. They were instantly available in one of the others. OK, I've got a, a message there that photos works in the library. Thank you very much for that, Nikki. Uh, yeah. Probably me then, never having gone in it. I figured it would. It reminded me of when Aperture was around and you only saw Aperture if you'd actually got an Aperture library. So I figured it would, but you never know, do you? But good, good to know it does. So it's just me then not using it. That's typical, isn't it? Right. OK, so I'm going to go on to the next thing. So we've looked at adding the global uh, items to the global library uh, that you can get to iTunes. You can get to photos and you can get to photo booth. Right. Because that global library is on the right hand side in the last tab of your inspector, you may want to spend more time in the other tabs. Maybe you're adjusting the properties of the video. Maybe you're adding annotations or you're working with text. And to keep switching back to that is going to be annoying. For that reason, they've got you covered. They have actually added over here on the left hand side. We now have this quick media library. So if I click there, it toggles on and up pops the media library and I have access to exactly the same things. First of all, I have access to the document library. Then I have access to photos, photo booth, iTunes and anything else that Mac OS considers to be a media provider. But I also have access to my global library so I can leave that floating around over there and I can actually use things from here. So I could add my where's my titles? There's my titles. So I could add my titles to that. It will pop it over the top. As we know, it's very big, but it's also added it in on us. Oh, no, that's right. That's right. That was me. So I shall go in and I think it was around 40 percent. And then I scaled it for the rest, didn't I? So I can add items onto there from this pop over or float over, depending on how, how you would like to call it. Now, I've only put in still images. You can put video in there and it makes more sense to show your duration overlays if you do have video in it. But what I get here when I do that is that each of these is infinity because it's just a single still. So you can do that in there as well. You can search for things. So if I had hundreds of things in there and I wanted just my watermarks, just start typing and it will instantly filter down for you. You can also choose to have that different sizes. So if you just wanted to have one and then scroll down, you could. Obviously, that makes more sense when it's not a watermark because you can actually see the content. So you can go down and do that. So a fully fledged global library. There's still a few things I'd like, but let's talk about that later. <laughs> OK, right. Just got another message. Garage band works. There's something else I don't have installed. And yet I used to use that all the time. Uh, I now use uh, Adobe Audition. Have a love hate relationship with Adobe. Not got time to discuss that, but there you go. OK, so I'm going to scale this down so it's about right. Um, I should probably mention as I'm scaling this down. Are you scaling it at all or are you just playing around? There we go. Uh, as you scale, the new option in the last version was to have it scale proportionally by default. So uh, that works well with these images. If you want to scale it not proportionally, so take that back, you need to hold the shift key down. So it's the reverse of virtually every other Mac app. As I said, there is a preference for that. If you are not happy with that, you can adjust the canvas lock aspect ratio when scaling with mouse and uh, that will flip it round and make it work like everything else. 
Right, so I've got a, a bit of a title there and I've got the, my, my video there as well. Right, next thing that's a, a big change and in a good way, in a good way. This is the um, ident that I use on my videos and what I tend to do is put two text blocks in it. So I'm going to go to my text tool and I'm going to add a text block right at the beginning uh, of this first element on the timeline. So just add a text block. Now, if you're with me live, did you notice anything different there? It was subtle and it now works the way it should do, which is the text is focused. I know that that sounds ridiculous. What do you mean? It wasn't before. The text is focused and you can instantly work with it. So what I usually say is, um, I think I put something like with a live audience, which is, I put that because um, I often wonder what people think when they're watching a video back that I'm talking to people and they're wondering on earth, who am I, who on earth am I talking to? Right, that's the default. I haven't changed anything with that um, other than change the actual text. So, but I don't want a backdrop on it. Uh, I don't want it that colour. So I'm going to choose a different colour. I have that red. That looks awful. Right, I have it a much lighter font and I don't have it anything like that big. So uh, let's take the size down. I think I have it 64. That looks a little bit better. Not quite so garish now, is it? Then I put in another block. Um, the other block that I put in is fairly similar to that one. So I'd be making the same changes. And this would be what it is. So in this case, it would be Screenflow 7, a first look. Now, at this point, usually, and I haven't done it this time, isn't that typical? I realise I've spelt something wrong. So uh, let's say I'm at this point just before the seven and I realise I, I want to, let's say I've, I've missed an O off there. And what I will do every single time, and I know I've been using this for nine years, I should know better now. Every single time I use the command key and the arrow keys to move to the end. What used to happen was that shortcut key shot me to the end of the timeline of the video, no matter where I was, no matter what I was doing. That was what it did. And I could not get my brain around the fact, don't do that. But now it actually works. So um, it's very subtle. Let me leave this there so you can see it. See that cursor flashing? As I go to the end, I can go back again. Command and left arrow key. Better than that, I can also use option and the arrow keys. And that will navigate me back word by word. You would not believe what a time saver that is. Absolutely loving that. So um, what I'll do with that is uh, make the changes to that. So uh, it was that block there. It was GeoSons. Uh, oh, I was going to fix that, wasn't I? There we go. Fixed it. Um, it was, I think, slightly more than 64. So let's go for 72. And I made it a grey. So that's what I do every single time I make a video. So oh, no, I need to take that background away, wouldn't I? I would need that background gone. There we go. So that's what it actually looks like. That's what I do every single time. And just those subtle changes to the text have made that a lot easier to work with. No, I know I'm doing that and I don't want reminding of it. Right. OK, so that was just pointing out that they've, they've let you focus the text and now you can navigate the text with the shortcut keys. But you can also add text animations, which you may have noticed. If you're a user of six or an earlier version, you may have noticed we've got a couple of extra options in here now. So we've got build in animation, build out animation. What I'm going to do before I get into the uh, details of actually showing you that is show you an example. So let's go up to file open. Do we have text animation? We do. There it is. Here's one I did earlier just to show you. Then I'll show you how to actually um, create this. But I'm just going to play this so you can actually see the text. So it's a bit like a lower third. And what has happened is that text has come in animated in the same way as it would in PowerPoint or Keynote. So that effect that I've added in there, if I click on the text to select it, and go to my text inspector. There is a tick next to build in animation. And as I open that up, you can see what I have actually done there. I have chosen as the type, a typewriter, and I've given it a duration of two seconds. I've not said fade anything though. Now, what I could do is give that a longer duration. So if I wanted that to build in more slowly, so let's say five seconds, I could do that. So I'll take it back and let's press play again. Same thing happens, just happens slower. 
And that's probably a better speed because there's a lot of text there. So I've done it as sort of a lower third. Right. I've also used, given the fact that it was a typewriter effect, I've used a typewriter font. So let's have a look how we would do that uh, in our other file, because in here I've got two lots of text, but I haven't got any text animation on it at all. Now, what I've decided I'll do, I would like the text ScreenFlow 7 a first look to come in first, and then I would like the with a live audience to come in after that, which means I need to move that up there and I need to double the length of that. I'm also going to need those titles behind it or it'll just be over black. And that means I will need to bump the video up to there. So that is what my timeline looks like now. And then I need to go in and set my preferences. So I'm going to choose um, my text. This is my ScreenFlow 7 and I'm going to go to the build in animation, use the disclosure triangle and it gives you all of these options. Now they look horrific, but they're not actually that complicated. First thing to do, put a tick in the box that gives you the animation. So the first thing is that it's disappeared. So if you notice there, when I toggle that tick on and off, the text actually disappears when I've toggled it on because we're working on a principle. The text isn't going to be there. You are about to build the build in. OK, so I have a tick in the build in animation. The next thing I need to choose is the type. And these are the types that you have. You've got break apart, center, character flip, gravity, move, move into place, scale or typewriter. So it's a case with those of actually working through them and seeing which one suits what you're doing. And that really is the case. Um, you see so many people doing video and live streams and stuff like that where they've got an effect on something and it doesn't really work. Now, I did a couple of videos. I did three videos, I think, the last time um, there was an update to ScreenFlow when ScreenFlow 6 came out. And they'd added in the animation to shapes, uh, object animation. And I did one for the gravity and what I did was say there was a price drop and I had the gravity effect and it worked. It suited it. It matched. So that was why using the typewriter, I chose a typewriter font. But I will show you that one again because that's the one you've seen. So let's replicate all of that. Now, when I choose typewriter, things change. And just to show you that over here, we now actually only have three and a bit options. We've got three options plus the duration. So the slider. But really, there's only the three options there. Whereas if I were to choose uh, move, we have all of these options. So we have build options where you can choose that. You can choose where it comes from. You can choose the distance and overlap, whether there's any easing on it. So the options you will see in here are very much dependent on what you actually choose. So we'll keep it simple and we will choose that typewriter one for the first start. And we don't want it to come in in less than a second because it, it would rush in. But uh, let's have a look how we're doing so far. That's fine if you do want it that fast. But I've allocated five seconds to that before the next one comes in. So if that took two seconds or even three seconds, that would that would probably be much better. So I'll put two and then go back to the beginning and have a look at how that looks. Oh, will you go away? Did I hit snooze instead of dismiss? I think I must have done. And do you know what term of notifications are? But never mind. Right. OK, so not too bad. I, th I think we can still get away with it a little bit slower. To my eyes, though, looking at it, I can't help thinking it would look much better if it was in a typewriter font because it just suits it. But I'm going to leave it alone because it's my font. But there we go. So it comes in. It takes three seconds to complete. Then I've got two seconds and then my next one comes in. But the next one that I've got coming in just appears. So what I need to do with that is select the next one and build an animation on that. So build in animation. And if I was to do the same again, typewriter and to take three seconds on that, it would then match. So let's take 10 seconds to watch that. So I'm going to make sure nothing's selected so it's nice and clean and you can see it all. And there we go. 10 seconds is an age, isn't it, when you're not speaking? Right, so that's how you do that. But that was only one option. And it might not be the best option, depending on your requirements. So let's have a look at some of the others. So let's say move uh, and let's give it still the three seconds. What's going to make it difference, the difference here is how you choose the build in terms of the build, the position, the distance and the overlap, as well as the easing. 
So let's leave it set like that and see what actually happens and then go in and tinker with it. You can see what happens. It fades in and it moves in from the left hand side and it comes in all together. Right, let's take that back and let's go in and make some changes to it. So what if instead of by line, we said by character? Hmm, got a shrewd idea what that will do. It all kinds of flies in from the back. I know it's looking like bad PowerPoint now, isn't it? But you might have a need for it to look like that. So you can do that if you want. Now that was coming in from the left hand side. But you can also choose here where it comes from. And that's what this option is with the arrows. And it's the um, it, the pointer, the arrow is, is pointing the direction that it will appear from. So if, for instance, you wanted that to appear the other way, you could do that too. So let's bring that in. It's now coming in from the other side. So it really does depend on just what effect that you are looking for. Let's go back. Now, we've done it by character. We've done it from there. We could have it from the top down. Let's have a look at that. For the sake of completeness, let's have a look at that. There we are. That doesn't look too bad. I would say if you were going to do something like that and you're going to then work with the red text to do the same, you're going to move it in. It makes sense to have that one moving up from the bottom. So let's see that. Now, it didn't look quite the same because I had it moving up from the bottom. But what I didn't do was actually say to it by character. If we say it by character, it should look exactly the same as the other one. So one flew in from down from the top, the other flew up from the bottom. So those are the kind of things that they've added in terms of text animation to them. Now, while we're looking at text, we also have other options. So I've clicked on my text there that says a first look. And I'm going to fold my animation up. I could, all, could also show you everything that I have shown you in relation to building in works if you're building out. So if I just put a tick in there and we go move by character and we have it moving. Let's have it moving off to the right. Uh, yeah, let's try that. So it, it builds in up to the three second mark. It sits there until seven seconds and then it starts to disappear. So let's just watch that. There's the other one's building in. Oh, that one's not. There we go. It disappears. Uh, it wasn't three seconds, was it? Uh, I didn't change the time. Naughty me. There we go. Let me change that to three seconds and uh, that should then work. So while the red one's building in, that one's going to disappear. There we go. Oh, it looks like a bad TV show from the 70s. The titles and credits on a bad TV show. There we are. But that's me. That's not the software. That's, that's me choosing silly things. Right. Let's go and have a look at this text. So in the text, never mind the build in, the build out, there's also kerning options now, which are available from just underneath the uh, outline colour there. And that sets um, the distance between your characters. It kerns the fonts to make them look better. Now, this one is pretty tightly kerned to start with, but how it works, one, two, three, four, five. I've expanded the space between the characters there five times by clicking the button five times. I can take that back. I've taken it back four. That doesn't look bad. That's how it looked before. And I can also tighten it up so I could tighten it up greatly. I wouldn't suggest you do that too much. It depends on the font uh, as to how much you, you can get away with there. Obviously, these words start to run into each other. But if you have a font that would look better kerned, you can actually do that in here now. So you have that option as well. Right, you will have noticed as I'm playing this, so I'm going to play this as I speak now. As I'm playing this, you will have noticed that I have video on the, that timeline. And the video I have is a stock image of a plane. And it's a plane landing at an airport. There we go. It is 11 and a half seconds worth of a plane landing at an airport. Right. That was it. Now. That's interesting as it goes, but wouldn't it be fantastic if it could go backwards? I actually had a client request this, you know, uh, he was a singer and he wanted to, he was doing this thing where he was walking across the stage and he thought it would be good to put in a bit where he walked backwards and then walked forwards again. And you couldn't really do it very easily. It was a nightmare, but now it's really simple. So I'm right clicking on the clip and there is an option to reverse the clip. So I will click that. And that's it. It's done. The indication you get that that is going to be reversed is there. So you get a double headed arrow pointing backwards. So let's have a look at that. Let's take it back to the text. And let's play it. And now the plane has already landed and you can see it taking off backwards. 
I thought this was a good one to actually demonstrate that with. Why you would want that, I'm not quite sure. But um, yeah, well, you've got to do it, haven't you? So if you do have a need for that, maybe you're doing demonstrations of something and you want to show how to undo it. Yeah, that would work, wouldn't it? You could actually work it backwards. Maybe you're doing a sketch within Illustrator or something like that. And um, you want to show undoing it, you can do it backwards. So that is available now as well. So really like that, actually. Right. One other thing that you can do is, and I have a trackpad sat in front of me. I will admit I do use a trackpad, but I use it left handed because I'm a mouse person. My trackpad I use left handed because I use it to zoom in and out of the timeline. So I'm constantly at this business with my left hand zooming it in and out. Now, if we look at the element that I've got on the canvas, I'm now doing a two fingered rotate like a pinch, but I'm not actually pinching in. I'm just rotating. And as I rotate, I can rotate elements on my canvas. So if you are a trackpad user, you are going to love that. Can't see me using that too much, but it's there. So it's always good to have these options, isn't it? Right. One of the other features that um, Telestream are talking about greatly. So I'm going to save that file and then close it. And uh, I've got my other files here. I'm going to use a different file for this. And the file I'm going to use is an MP4 file. Oh, no, I can't do that. I need a new I need a new file. So uh, I will create a new file. I knew you'd do that to me opening up on the wrong screen. I'm going to make it 1280 by 720 HD. And there's my new empty file. Now, the reason that I'm doing this is I'm going to show you um, that there's been a big improvement editing MP4 files. This is for people who forget to press record when they're going live on YouTube. Who do that? I did that. Yes, I did do that. And uh, that's why I have this file that I had to download from YouTube. I know. Now, it's um, recorded from YouTube. It's quite long. And I also want to show you. Oh, it's disappeared. I'll show you that in a minute. I also wanted to show you. Right. Um, it's quite long. So let's have a look how long it is. It's an hour 48 ish now, 47. Now I can show you. All right. You can see a little progress indicator there, like a little speedometer. And it's saying 13 percent, 14 percent. And my fans will probably come on and you'll probably hear those as well. What it's doing is rendering the audio timeline. So if I move away from there and show you what's happening here. Now, this used to take forever. And that is an improvement that they've actually added. So it, it no longer takes forever. And you have some indication of how long it will take before it is completely ready for you to work with. So that's there as well. That progress indicator appears when you're bringing video in, when you're bringing audio in and when you do certain things that it needs time to think. So it's really just an indicator to tell you how long that will actually take to complete. So handy for that to be there. Now, it used to take a long time to, to edit this kind of video, um, but now it's much, much quicker. So what I'm doing is I'm trying to find here my in point and I can see from that gap on my timeline that that will have been my in point. So what I would want to do with that is press the O key, which marks an out point. I'll show you that on the full timeline. So that's the bit that I don't want. So having pressed the O key for out, I'm now going to press command and backspace and that will take that away. So that beginning bit that was all waffle and I don't want has disappeared. Right over on the right hand side, I now need to lose the end. So I think there was about that. That looks like me wrapping up. That was the last demonstration. Um, did I do that before or after the event? Let's have a look. Mm, that's not me wrapping up. That's me wrapping up. So uh, the screen should go black and the audio timeline should be very quiet, which it is there. So that's my end point. So I would press E there and that trims to my end point. And now I have edited that video. What I then needed to do with it was export it out. But you've seen it's much faster to work with. You've not got that lag going on. What I would do with this and remember what I've done, I've made a new empty file. There were no assets in it whatsoever. Um, I would need my titles putting at the beginning. And if you remember, they're in the global library. So now it's really simple. All I need to do is double click. That will put it on there. I need to scale it down because it's far too big and that's the wrong one. So let me zoom in. That's the right one. Where have you gone? Uh, how I do this is usually zoom out, but I'm trying to keep this where I'm not zooming in and out too much because it makes you seasick when you're watching. There we go. Let's take it down. Are we nearly there? These assets are huge, aren't they? They have to be to look decent on retina. That's the issue. 
Right, so there it is. So I've got uh, my titles in. I would then move my video. I would also have put in some audio in here. I would put my text over the top of that, exactly the same as I did in the previous one. And I would also go to the end of that timeline, which is where I am now, whizzing along there. And I would put my credits in and I have my credits. There are my credits. So double click to insert those. Same principle. I would need to go into there and I would need to change that. Was it around 30 something? 35 ish percent. Move it to the right place and just scale it. There we go. And at that point, I would save that file. So I will save the file. So let's save it into my data file. And this was Affinity Photo, another one of my favorite apps. There we go. So that is now saved and that's saved as quickly as you saw it then. That's it. And this machine is doing so much more as I'm doing this. It's broadcasting to YouTube. It's recording audio, doing all kinds of things. And it still saved it that, that quickly. So um, big improvement there. One of the other things that you can do and gamers are going to love this. If we look down at um, let's let's look across at the timeline here. You have a couple of options across the timeline. You have your transport controls in the middle. Increasingly, Telestream have been adding functionality to the timeline. So as we move across here, they added the ability to mute the audio. And they also added three icons last time, which was the snapping, the uh, thumbnails and the audio right across there as low as you can go on the right hand side there is now an option to toggle between so i'll just toggle that off between 30 frames a second and 60 frames a second so i'll just turn it to 60 frames a second while i'm at it and update that and now i'm editing in 60 frames a second okay so if i go back there you can see here that normally that would go up to uh, that's one hour, six minutes, 13 seconds, and it would normally go up to 30 frames, but it's now going up to 60 frames. So you can choose to do that, give yourself smoother edits, smoother uh, performance overall. So it now does 60 frames a second. Now, one of the biggest changes is uh, how you come to export it. Now, sometimes they have to make changes when Apple force changes upon them. This has happened before and it broke my workflow. I was not a happy bunny. I did find a way to work around it, thankfully. So I'm just going to close that app down while I'm there as well. Right. So um, I've got this video. Uh, I'm not going to want to do it with this Affinity Photo one because it's huge. So I'm going to lose that video and I'm going to go back into the aircraft one, which is much smaller, less than 22 seconds. So because I'm going to upload this, I want something that's very small, but it will work just as well with larger videos. It will just take a little bit longer. So the export options, sometimes changes are foisted upon them. But this time, if you go into file and export, the options that you have by default are these automatic ones. So really it's for newbies or when you just don't want to think. Now you don't make me think about it. I don't want to have to think about this. I just want to export it quickly. You can choose the fastest export, a normal speed of export or the slowest export. You can also choose your resolution. So I probably want that 1280. Um, and you can choose to letterbox the contents and add motion blur, etc. But it's very simplistic. There are only these three options for speed and then your standard options underneath. If at this stage you are freaking out thinking, but 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 I've got some custom things going on. That's OK, because there are also manual presets here. So you can still choose other options your web high, web low, uh, lossless and all kinds of stuff. You can see I've got a custom one at the bottom here, which exports at 1080, 60 frames a second for, for me to then put things on YouTube. Um, you can still do all of that. You can still go in and you can still customize everything in there. You can still go in and manage them in exactly the same way you used to be able to. So you can add extra cust custom presets. You can copy existing presets and then tweak them to your liking. It's all still there. But for speed, you have these automatic options. So that's one of the uh, bigger changes that Telestream have been talking about. Now, you will also note in here while you are doing that, that as you make changes in here. So initially that was set to 1920. There is now this little option, maximum file size, 17 meg. As I make changes in here, so as I change that to 1280 by 720, it now says maximum file size, 8 meg. What's it talking about? It's talking about the maximum space you will need on your hard drive to be able to process this video. Now, to be honest, if the difference is 17 meg to 8 meg, I'm sure we've all got that much free. If we didn't, 
Mac OS wouldn't be running. But it comes in very handy when I go over to the manual settings and I start playing around in here because remember that this is 21 and a half seconds of video. But look at the maximum file size, the maximum space that would be needed, 425 meg, which means you're looking at over a gig a minute for something like that. So if I process my video that was an hour and 20 odd minutes, you can see I'm going to need a lot of free disk space. My drive is a one terabyte SSD, but even then, if I'm processing a video and I'm doing it twice, I sometimes stop and think, will I have enough disk space? And I have to, up till now, I've had to guess. But now with this one, you don't have to guess. You will know for sure. Uh, I found in, in testing it that actually it usually overestimates a bit. So it does give you a little bit of overhead to work with as well. OK, um, let's come out of there. Oh, no, hang on. I need to do this, don't I? Yes, I need to go into the automatic and I actually need to do this. So I'm going to process this and I'm going to put it um, on my desktop, in, which is probably a terrible idea because it's synchronizing with um iCloud. But there again, it's only 8 meg. So I think it, it shouldn't stress it too much, should it? So I'm choosing normal. I'm choosing at 1280 by 720. And I'm just going to click export on that and see how fast that goes. I was going to say it was going pretty quickly then. And then it kind of staggered and stopped a little bit, but it isn't taking that long. So uh, that said 8 meg. If we actually look at that now, which is on my desktop here, and we look at the properties of that, um, it's actually 13.8 meg. So uh, did it say 8 or did it say 14? Oh, I've forgotten now. I'm sure it said 8, but never mind. That's the size it is. So you've got a shrewd idea of how it's actually working. So let's go back into it. That was exporting when you want to export it locally. But what ScreenFlow has been able to do for some time is send your video places um, virtually automatically. So all you need to do is go to File, and instead of export, go to publish. And you have a range of um, services that you can publish it to. You can publish it to Vimeo, YouTube, Google Drive, Dropbox, Facebook, Wistia, Telestream Cloud, Box. And I, I'm not sure how to pronounce that. Is it Imja? Something like that. But it's for animated GIFs anyway. So those are the options you've got. Now, deliberately, and I really shouldn't do this in a live demo, but hey, let's go for it. I have not, with this version of ScreenFlow, logged into any of these services. So I'm going to do it live. I know this is what I'm saying. I'm insane. So I'll choose box. And this is what happens when you do this for the first time. So it needs you to say what video encoding you would like. Um, so I'll go for 720. You can choose your frame rate, 30 or 15. So I'll leave it set to 30. You can choose to letterbox, motion blur, and you can save a copy to the disk as well. So that's probably a good idea, isn't it? And uh, I'll choose the location. I'll put it in movies. There we go. I'll put it in movies. Um, and then you are ready to go. But at this stage, you're not signed into Box. Now, once you're signed in, you won't have to sign in again until Box loses your credentials and you need to do it. Um, if at this stage you've changed your mind, there is a disclosure triangle that lets you change your mind and choose a different service. So you could maybe go up then to Dropbox and do it there. You'll notice, though, that you, you lose the presets because now it's suggesting progress. So it doesn't keep the presets. And I did want box. So let's go back to box. But that has remembered everything that I did. So the only thing I need to do now is to sign in. So I'm going to click the sign in option. And what happens is in a browser, it gives me that to log into. What it's saying is, uh, will you give ScreenFlow access to box? And that's what it needs to do. So what I'll do is uh, I'll go in here where I've got my one password options for box and it will log me in. And what it's saying is, uh, do you want to, to grant ScreenFlow access to read and write all the files and folders stored in box? And I will say yes, grant access to box, at which point it brings me back to ScreenFlow. And now I've got more options available to me. Uh, so I can put a title in if I want. Uh, it's actually required. So I'll put in there aircraft. And I can put in a description, the description being optional, but I'll put in the description of my video so we can see where that appears. And then I've got my sharing options so I can make it public. Uh, I can make it company only, collaborators only, or I can make it private. So if you're going to share it direct from Box, you would need to make that public. If you're doing this in a corporate environment, you could choose company only or 
your collaborators or you could make it private and then give people access to it on a one by one basis. Or you can put a password on it. Now, I'm just going to make it public. So I'm going to se select to publish that and it goes away and has a think about it. And uh, it's not doing too badly. Remember that at this point it's doing two things. It's sending it up to Box, but it's also making a copy locally for me. So that's great because that means it does it in one go. I don't have to go and make a local copy and then manually go and upload it to Box. So at that point it should be done. Let's have a look what Box is saying. Uh, here's my Box stuff. Uh, it's taken me to Box. It wants me to log in. So what I'll do is I'll uh, go log in while we're looking at that. It has actually finished. I have already logged into Box once, but I'll do it again just, just for good measure. And uh, hopefully we'll be able to see that file. Where have you actually put it? What stuff have I got on here? Where have you actually put it? Hmm. I can see lots of files. What I'm not seeing is uh, my ScreenFlow file. I've got screenshots. So I'm looking at this on my other screen to uh, try and find it. And I'm not seeing it. Hmm. That's not great, is it? Let me refresh Box. Doubtless it'll be Box needing to update itself or um, what it could have done was put it in a folder. So uh, I'm trying to frantically have a look for it and uh, I'm not getting very far with that. What I'll do is I'll do a search. That would help, wouldn't it? Uh, if I search for it, are you going to show me? Aircraft. No, it can't find it yet. So I think what's happening is it might need a little bit of time for Box to strut its stuff. So I'll leave that on the other screen and we can come back to that because what I'm going to do next is repeat that process, but not with Box. I'm going to go back to File and go back to Publish To. This time I'm going to choose Dropbox. And again, I have not logged into Dropbox at all. Uh, we don't want it to be ProRes. That, that would be too big. We'll make this web high and we'll scale it to... Uh, can we just... Uh, no, we'll make it 100%. So uh, it's going to be 1280 by 720. You can, as I say, go in and customise and manage this to your heart's content. You can also save a copy to disk. So I'll choose a different location for that because we've already got one in there. I will go to my desktop and I will put it in uh, the root of my data folder and save that there. Now, at this point, as I say, I am not logged into Dropbox. So I'm going to sign in. This time it's a different way. So this is why I'm showing you this. It is a different way to work it. It's saying uh, authorize Dropbox in your default browser. So uh, when it's completed, they will give you a code and you need to enter that code in there. So what's happening in my browser on my other screen is this. It's giving me um, an option to log into Dropbox. Ooh, that icon needs updating, doesn't it? Right, so I'm going to go into there. I've got two Dropbox accounts. So I'm going into that one. There is my Dropbox. There we go. And will you allow this? Yes, I will. Yes, I will. And it gives me this code. So I'm going to copy that code. I'm going to go back over there and I'm going to give it that. And that should be all it needs. As I do this, oh now come on. Yep, it's actually doing it. Account information, file name required. So I'll call this aircraft. There we are. And I would like a public link. The content will be private on Dropbox, but I will have a public link to it and I will click the button. That one's even faster. Although it does seem to stop, doesn't it? About halfway. Stop about halfway. There we go. But it's thinking about it. It's doing it. It'd be nice if it actually gave me the link rather than have me having to go to Dropbox and going to try and find it. So uh, let's go to Dropbox. And it probably wants me to log in again. Nope, this time it's remembered. So it's, um, it's actually taken me into Dropbox. So let me just see if I can find the file. Uh, no, I don't want to go on a tour. Right. Let's end the tour and try and find the file. Can I do a search for aircraft on here? Oh, I want to find this file so I can share it. Uh, uh, uh. Well, isn't that fantastic? <laughs> I think it's going to take a little bit of time to find this because I've searched for aircraft and I'm not seeing a thing. It can't find it yet. So uh, hopefully that will toggle along like the um, one in box and I'll be able to find it. So I'm just doing another quick search on box. It's not turned up on box yet either, but it will do. I'm sure it will do. Just a little bit of time needed for that. OK, right. That's um, a lot of features that I've demonstrated. What I'm going to do now is give you a very quick over over uh, recap of what I've talked about, but also some extra features that I haven't had the time to talk about. 
So um, let's get back into here and uh, do that quick recap. So first thing we looked at, now I've got a dark interface. I left it alone at the dark theme, but you can toggle that back if you want to. Second thing I talked about was that the preview view has gone and been replaced by collapsing the panels, the timeline panel and the inspector panel on the right hand side. New feature for MacBook Pro users, but also people who use um, Touche from Red Sweater Software. That is red-sweater.com slash Touche. And that is a free application if you want to have a play with it. Uh, let's just see if I can actually show you that while we're here. There you go. It appears at the bottom and there's my slides. So uh, because I'm in Keynote, that is actually live working with the stuff that I've got in Keynote. So um, you can use that. I would suggest you a play with that anyway. You probably get to love it. So um, you will have on your MacBook Pro or on Touche dedicated controls that will be context sensitive depending on what you're doing. And as I say, that is Touche from Red Sweater Software. We also looked at user defined shortcut keys, of which there are now lots, with an entirely new shortcut manager built in. Uh, you have extra options that you can assign configurable shortcut keys to. So you have the option to hide the inspector, the timeline, show the quick media library. You can select everything that's um, under the playhead. All of those things can now have shortcut keys allocated to them. One of the ones that's most useful is actually hiding desktop icons when you're recording and you can allocate shortcut keys to that as well. We looked at the shortcut key editor, which is within the preferences. So um, from within there, not only can you customize the shortcut keys, but you can also export those sets. So they are available both for yourself and to share with other users. One of the big changes is the global media library which allows you to import your content, be that video, audio, still images, whatever it is, into a global me media library, which is available for every file that you subsequently create um, inside ScreenFlow. Working with text is greatly improved. You can now, uh, the text is focused automatically as soon as you add it, so you can edit it straight away, which is more of a time saver than you would actually imagine. Big thing with text is the text animations, of which we saw a couple of options there. Um, very similar, as I said, to PowerPoint and to Keynote. So if you're familiar with those, you can do all of that now inside um, ScreenFlow. There is kerning options available with two buttons where you can tighten the cur kerning or loosen the kerning. There was also the option to play clips backwards. And I'm looking at the chat and I'm being told here um, that it also works with audio, which which can be very funny. Yes, I would love to try it with audio. Uh, don't really demonstrate audio when I'm going live because I've got my own audio going on as well. And oh, it would all be hideous. But yes, if it works with audio as well, that, that's amazing. That'd be great. So when I was talking about the gentleman that wanted the video of himself walking backwards, he could also be singing backwards as he's walking backwards. So, yeah, that would be great. We also looked at uh, how you've got the uh, two fingered rotate gesture on your trackpad. So you can now work with elements on the canvas in the same way that you may well do in other applications if you are a trackpad user. I looked at MP4 performance where I edited a file that was an hour and 35 minutes ish, I think. And uh, it was greatly improved. I was able to do that while I'm broadcasting all of the rest of this to you. And I'm actually recording my screen as well as I'm doing everything else. Uh, the waveform progress um, was that little progress indicator that was on there that it is now much, much quicker. That has always been painfully slow in um, ScreenFlow. Sometimes it is actually broken as well with various updates, but it is now much faster. So it's not instant, but it's, it's almost getting there. And depending on the length of the video, now it does it that fast, you hardly notice it doing it. One thing I didn't actually demonstrate, but does actually happen now, is that if you choose to add multiple items to the timeline, it will do it in sequence rather than stacking them. So again, just a quick time saver. There's support for higher frame rates. So from 30 to 60, as you saw me um, demonstrate, I flipped one from 60, from 30 to 60. And then I went on to look at the export options and hopefully what, at some point my video will arrive in, in Dropbox and Box. Um, export options where you're saving it to your desktop or you're saving it to your local machine. Uh, and then you have the options to send it elsewhere. Um, you've also got these calculate exported file size. You'll notice from the slide there that when I processed one of my videos, it was telling me I was going to need five gig, which was what I was saying about the quality of the video um, 
can use an awful lot of space and I was never quite sure how much space I would need. So for me, that's, a, that's actually a really big feature. And yet it's only sort of six words on a screen, but it, it's a great feature to add. You can also upload your very short tutorials to the site that um, hosts animated GIFs. So that's available. We looked at sending it to Box as well as sending it to Dropbox. Now, there were features that I didn't mention, but uh, are new to version seven. There is an enhanced motion blur. So you can choose between light, medium and heavy for the motion blur that you add. So it really affects the, um, the strength of the effect, really. So you've got that option. One thing that ScreenFlow used to do was um, it's got its own document recovery system going on. But if you've got that functionality turned on native to Mac OS, there was some conflicts that could arise. Um, and projects may become corrupt. Now, I did have a couple of options, a couple of times that happened to me. Um, so I started making duplicates of files, but with that turned off, it seems to be a lot more stable. So it was what was happening when both systems were engaged. So um, you've got that to think about now as well. Now, when you're processing out video, you've now got Multipass 264. So Multipass means it goes through the process more than once being known as single pass. When it does that, it creates a higher quality output. So important to know about. It also has Intel Quick Sync hardware accelerated encoding, which means it can take advantage of any hardware that you have available to make the encoding faster. So um, you'll notice that mainly when you're exporting to the highest possible quality. Um, it will depend on the system you have, is what I would say about that. The Mac I'm using it on is a brand new 2017 iMac. So as you saw, the speed was there. You could actually see it. You also now have um, access to Apple audio units. You may know them as AAUs and they have a common user interface and you can get to that through ScreenFlow. Uh, also, while we're discussing audio, there are now panning and gain controls for the audio input devices. So um, it's great when you're when you've got a complex multi-channel workflow going on. You can solo multiple audio channels. So really, they've added brought it more into line with um, a professional DAW software. So digital audio um, software. And when it records the cursor, it records a retina cursor now. So it automatically records a higher resolution cursor. Now, if you've been screencasting as long as I have, I'm going back now to when I first got a Mac in 2006. I used to use an app, the name of which escapes me, but the, the mouse pointer used to stagger across the screen and leave mouse trails behind it. And really, the only thing you could do was not move the mouse much, which wasn't great for demonstrations, especially in Photoshop. So now you've got this very smooth and high quality uh, mouse recording going on. Uh, the letterboxing option is on by default, so it will be applied by default if any of the exports, if the ratio you choose, um, it doesn't match the canvas. It will letterbox it automatically for you. Uh, and also, big thing, I think this is the most commonly used language in the world, there is now a Spanish language version available. Right before we wrap up, what are you going to need to make this work? Well, it's Mac only. So you're going to need a Mac. It will need to be an Intel based Mac and it will need a 64 bit processor. Uh, they recommend an I, a Core i3 um, or, or better is recommended. Now, with it saying an Intel based Mac, that does not include a Hackintosh. So it needs to be a supported Mac as well. Now, in terms of operating systems, the minimum supported by version 7 is 10.11 uh, El Capitan and 10.12 uh, Sierra. You will also need a minimum of 2 gig of RAM. But to be honest, if you haven't got 2 gig, I doubt you'll be running El Capitan or Sierra. And you'll need 20 gig of hard drive space. Again, I think that is actually quite a lot if you think about it in terms of um, smaller SSDs. But... Um, Hopefully you will have that 20 gig required. Now, in terms of the hardware, you will also need an Apple approved graphics card. And that's where the no Hackintosh thing comes into play. So it will need to be an approved graphics card. Um, I'm thinking I would struggle to get this running on my old um, Mac Mini, which was old as, older than the hills because I've not updated it in years. So I, I would probably get it, probably have it struggling running on that. But if you've got a recent, and um, by recent, I mean probably in the last sort of four or five years, iMac, you should be absolutely fine with that or a Mac Pro. 
Um, it also supports uh, cameras, but it doesn't support anything that uses HDV. So it doesn't support that. Now, when it comes to buying, oh, this is the minefield, isn't it? You've got decisions to make and anything that involves decisions, not good. Right. On launch day, and I don't know for how long this is good, but this is my interpretation of it today. And as I say, it only came out about two hours ago. You, If you don't have ScreenFlow at all, uh, you're looking at $129 to buy it. If you are upgrading direct from Telestream, it's going to cost you around $39. Now, when I say upgrading, if you are going to upgrade, it will have to be from version 4, 5 or 6. If it's older than that, you will need to purchase again at full price. So versions 1, 2 and 3, upgrade pricing not supported. Now, sadly, <laughs> the complication doesn't end there. With versions 4, 5 and 6, if you want to see upgrade pricing, the way you need to do it is to install version 4, 5 or 6. If you have all of them, I'd go for the latest, so 6, the most recent. And you need to activate your existing serial number. Once you've done that, there will be an, an option to upgrade to version 7 and the price that you see will now be the upgrade price. If you don't have an activated serial number, you will not see the upgrade pricing. So you need to be aware of that. That's the first thing. Um, now, you could be in a situation where you have version four, but you are now running on Sierra and you can't install it, in which case you are going to need to contact Telestream support and they will help you out there. So that's the things to know about upgrading if you are upgrading today and you're doing it direct from Telestream. If you have the Mac App Store version and you want to upgrade today, it's going to cost you $39. I believe the price is $38.99 in pounds. So I've put it down as $39. That is today's price. There is no upgrades from the App Store, as we all know. There are virtual ways around it, but generally speaking, there are no update upgrade prices in the App Store. So there is a limited sale. I do not know for how long that sale is on. My last, what I last read was a, one day. It's usually maybe two or three days, but you know, you need to make your mind up if you want it. Um, but today I've just seen it in the App Store. It is $38.99 in pounds, so $39 today. So that's your launch day pricing. If it is not launch day, then the usual pricing applies. It will still cost you $129 to buy a new version direct from Telestream. And if you have an upgradable older version, which means four, five or six, then you will see an upgrade price of $39. So that if you have a version direct from Telestream, you don't need to think about upgrading today. You can take it for a trial run. Be aware the limitation on the trial is not 30 days, the limitation on the trial that you would be thinking about is that it has demo version across all outputs. So you can play around with it and you can export things, but you wouldn't be able to use them anywhere because it would say demo across it. But it is other than that is a fully fledged demo version. But you don't need to make that decision today because you would be able to upgrade in two weeks, three weeks or even a month. If you're like me, you just upgrade straight away. But that's me. In the App Store, I don't know what the pricing will be. I'm guessing it will be comparable with the price at Telestream. So I'm guessing around the $129 mark. And as I've said, there are no upgrades available from the App Store until Apple provide that. Telestream can't. So that's what it what is required in terms of pricing. Now, there will be various things going on there with, well, I only bought it here and can I get it there? Right. Um, if you bought ScreenFlow 6 from Telestream within the last 30 days, uh, or was it the whole of June? I think I think June was mentioned and we're now the 1st of August. So within the last sort of 30 to 60 days, then contact Telestream and um, have a word with them. So that's what they're saying. Now, in terms of the Mac App Store, if you bought it yesterday from the Mac App Store, they will give you a free update. But it won't be an App Store version. It will be direct from them. And what they will need from you is to know that you have purchased it. They will need a copy of your purchase paperwork. Now, that's as good as far as it goes. Now, let's get into why you would buy it from one rather than the other. 
The version from Telestream is activated and to move it to a new machine, you would need to deactivate it, which you can do. It used to be able to be activated on two machines. According to what I've read, it's now one machine, which you may find a little limiting. But as I've said, you can deactivate it and then go to another machine. In terms of I've just bought another Mac and I want to record on that and I've already got it activated and I don't want to edit on that one. What do I do? You could record. Don't forget that this limitation on the trial version is on exporting it. So if you export on one machine, you can all you're all right to record it on another one and then you can just delete it off that machine. So that's if you buy it direct from Telestream. If you buy it from the Mac App Store, you are eligible to install it on as many Macs as Apple support which at the moment, they've not said publicly, five has been mentioned and six has been mentioned, but I think it's really a bit hit and miss. It just depends on what mood Apple are in this week. But there is no activation per se. You have to be able to log into their store and um, install it. So that's what happened with version six. I'm told by looking at the release notes um, that it, it is licensed for as many installs as Apple allow from the store. OK. So when you're making your mind up about that, I think that is the biggest differentiator between the two. The of the only other thing that I think about when I think, do I want something from the App Store? Or do I want something from Telestream is if there's if there's a bug. And I'm not saying there is, but let's say if there was a bug and they brought out a bug fix, it's likely you'll get it faster if you're a Telestream customer because it's got to go through the review process on the Mac App Store. It is for this reason that I buy both, but that's just me. Your mileage may vary. Um, I like to have it where I get the fastest updates, but sometimes it's like I'm out and I just need to install it for five minutes and I haven't got the activation and I can't deactivate the other one and all of the rest of that. In which case I just install it from the app store, then delete it when I'm done. So it just depends on your circumstances. You will find all of the information about that available direct from Telestream. Uh, there is this full 10 day trial and the only limitation during that 10 days is the export will have demo on it. So you will get the information at telestream.net slash screenflow. If you want to watch this again, which is a bit meta, isn't it, if you're already watching it, uh, you will find everything that I am putting out about ScreenFlow 7 on my uh, site at elainegiles.co.uk slash ScreenFlow-7. And when I say everything, when uh, version 6 came out, I wrote a long review that was quite detailed in terms of everything they'd added. And I will be doing the same for ScreenFlow 7, and it will be on that page, as will the link to this video and any of the extra videos that I put out about individual little features of it. So um, make a note of that and... Uh, you will be able to, to find it. If you can't remember that, then I've been Elaine Giles. Thank you very much for being with me live or watching later. Um, you can find me all over the internet as Elaine Giles. So just search for Elaine Giles ScreenFlow 7 and you will find everything that I have done for it. What I will be doing now is uh, going into the Q&A and taking live questions from you or just chatting about are you upgrading and all sorts of things ScreenFlow related. Um, I have another live session uh, this week. So uh, I'll be looking at Affinity Designer and how that relates to ScreenFlow is a lot of the assets that I use in my videos I make in Affinity Designer. So what you're looking at now was made in Affinity Designer. So um, check that out if you'd like uh, to chat with me again or you're interested in Affinity Designer. But uh, other than that, check out the videos that I've done in relation to ScreenFlow and um, I look forward to hearing from you. Do contact me with all your questions, queries, comments. Would love to hear from you. But I will see you next time.